Thank you all for attending this webinar, Understanding Disabilities and Accessibilities in Town, Schools, and Healthcare. I'm Maeve Clark. And I'm Maya Beach. And we are high school students who will be moderating this webinar. This is Maeve. I'm wearing, I am a white teenage girl with shoulder length brown hair and brown eyes. I am wearing a blue shirt in front of a light blue wall. This is Maya speaking. I'm also a teenage girl who's half East Asian, half white, with shoulder length black hair and dark brown eyes. Today I'm wearing a black t-shirt and sitting in front of my house plants, assorted art, and a light blue wall. Before we begin, we wanted to thank our ASL interpreters, Rachel and Kelly, for being here and providing ASL interpretation. Live Zoom, tra Zoom transcription is also enabled. The audio and video for this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our public YouTube channel. To participants, please keep your camera off to help us record our video. If you have any questions, please privately mes message myself, Maya, or our other ma moderator, Maeve or Olivia. This is Maeve speaking. Lastly, we want to acknowledge the Massachusetts Strat, the tribe of indigenous people from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth of Massachusetts have taken their name. I would like to pay my respect to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit the historical Massachusetts tribe territories to this day. All right, to start off, uh, this is my speaking. And now we're happy to introduce our first panelist, Mary Kalbach, an occupational therapist and assistive technology practitioner who will talk about defining a disability. Oh, Mary, I think you're muted. Okay. That work? Yeah. My name is Mary Kalbach. I'm an occupational therapist. I'm 50 years old. I'm Caucasian. My hair is tied back in a ponytail. And I'm sitting in my bedroom with a fireplace behind me and a dresser. I have been working in the field of disabilities since I started about 24 years ago. Spent many years working with children in schools and most recently worked for the state of Massachusetts in the Department of Developmental Services running a wheelchair clinic. My goal today is to talk about the differences between ability, impairment, and disability and the dynamic interplay that can happen between them. And I'm going to start my slideshow. And I'm not so clever, so hang on just a minute. There we go. So my goal in becoming an occupational therapist as a person who had fallen into a pool at four years old and was lucky enough to come out healthy and whole, my goal in doing that was to begin to understand that all people are unique and important and that all people are whole and that all people have strengths and needs that must be met. Um, as somebody who is just very lucky to be able to walk and talk and hear and to have had such a close experience with death and to be functioning without any disability or impairment, I feel incredibly blessed. And then I wanna be able to pass what I can and my gifts along to help others on their journey. Um, so the other piece is that we wanna understand that all people are powerful, not in spite of their disabilities or complexities, but because of them. Um, one of the things that I think a lot about and is how we choose to speak about people with disabilities. And there's some controversy within the community and within the community a lot outside of the disability community about how we do that. Um, so some people prefer identity first language and that language places the disability first and fully honors the disability as an integral part of the person's identity for which there is absolutely no reason to feel shame. And an example of that would be say to call someone with epilepsy an epileptic person. And then there's person first language, which places the person before the disability, which is person with epilepsy. Um, and for me, as long as our intent is to be respectful and honor a person, then we land in the right place. Um, so just to start, a very simple definition of an ability is the possession of, this, of the means or skill to do something. An impairment is an absence or significant difference in a person's body structure, social emotional functioning, or mental functioning. 
and a disability is a condition of the body or mind that makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities and interact with the world around them. The ADA defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life functions. And for me, that is an interesting conversation because a physical impairment pertains to the loss of an anatomical structure. And for the benefit of this exercise, say a person's maybe lost a leg due to an accident, that person could wear a prosthetic as a replacement to the leg. The physical, the physical disability now refers to the inability to walk, to navigate their surroundings. Um, but what if we gave that person a wheelchair? Now that person ha has mobility and they are better able to interact with their world and to move around. Another example would be dyslexia. Um, dyslexia is a learning impairment or a reading impairment. The inability to read is now the student's learning disability. However, what happens when we give somebody technology that allows them to listen to a story or to have other ways of um, looking at the information and getting that information in? So you could tape a lecture, um, you could have somebody verbalize it for them or that sort of thing. Um, as an occupational therapist, I get excited because what's really critical is knowing that we have some ability to change the environment to accommodate a person's impairment. Um, and in so doing, we can get rid of what we call disability. Um, so the dynamic interplay between how we set up a world um, literally enables people to engage with their world in the same way that you and I do. Um, and this is where I become you know, a, a proponent for the field that I work in because we're a person first field in occupational therapy. And we're always working with people to help them work on their identified goals to meet their ADLs, which would be you know, their ability to get up and get dressed and feed themselves or their IADLs, the things that they love to do, um, their hobbies, their work. Um, so we, when we look at as a person's described idea or goal for what they want to move towards, we look at it from three different places. We look at the impairment and see if we can rehabilitate the impairment and make it disappear. We accommodate the environment around them, or we may modify the task so slightly so that a person can achieve their end goals. Um, and so that's really just the starting point of this dialogue so that we could have some common language about how to move forward with respect for the community of people that, that has a disability. Um, and that's all I have to share with you. This is Maya speaking. Uh, thank you so much, Mary, for giving us an introduction into terms revolving around disability. This is May speaking. Oh my God. Our next panelist is Penny Shaw, an aging and disability advocate who will discuss Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the responsibilities of all cities and towns to be more accessible. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, hold on. I'm just gonna make you, uh, I'm just gonna pin you real quick. Can you hear me though? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Sorry, one second. Sorry, I like don't see the button right now. Oh, Penny, are you able to start your video? I wonder if that's why it's not working. Is that now? Yes, thank you. That helped. Okay, it just came out of the screen. It wasn't there before. Can, 
Should I start? Yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, I just have a little iPad. I'll try to sit up. Um, I'm a 78 year old woman with very little hair left. Uh, what I have is white. I'm sitting in a wheelchair. I came to disability as we're defining it today at age 58. Um, when I got a rare disease called Dillon Barre, and I'm par primarily paralyzed in my chair. I'm wearing an orange shirt with a sort of like white spots, but they're not circular, they're square, and uh, I'm in my wheelchair. Okay, I'm going to talk to you today about the American Disabilities Act, uh, Title II. As you already know, the ADA is a civil rights law that prevents discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, including jobs, schools, transportation, and all public and private spaces open to the general public. Um, the ADA is divided into five titles or sections. Title II applies to state and local government entities. It protects individuals with disabilities from discrimination on the basis of disability in services, programs, activities provided by a state and local government, your communities. I chose this topic for two reasons. First, I'd like to emphasize that justice can begin at home in your neighborhood. And second, because this is a topic I have personal experience with. I live in Braintree, and back in 2018, along with three other residents in Braintree, we had lawyers file a lawsuit against our town, alleging violations of Title II and its implementing regulations. We sought relief, enforcement of our rights as people with disabilities to access everywhere in town. No time today to tell you the details in between, but we did settle our case in 2020, and a lot of the implementation has been put on hold because of the pandemic. Um, what I'd like to do today is to go through different categories of non-compliance at the city. Braintree is um, legally a city now, but we still by, by the name of town, so I'll refer to us as a town. I'm going to give you examples of the kinds of uh, non-compliance that exist in my town um, that you might probably, most probably will find in your towns as well. The first one regards the architectural uh, uh, architectural issues related to buildings. Uh, does it make sense? All town-owned buildings must be uh, readily accessible and usable by people with disabilities. I'm going to just give you types of uh, violations that we found in Burnetree. Some of them come from town hall, public schools, elder affairs, the police station, our emergency management division, our electric light division, even our municipal golf course. Examples of violations we found were that the handicapped parking aisles were blocked, that the parking lot itself was uneven and dangerous for people with wheelchairs, that sidewalks outside the building, when there was an event, they were often blocked with tables. Um, that the ramps to the into the buildings were often blocked by vehicles and other objects. That if there was more than one floor, access to other floors were often uh, not accessible. They didn't maintain the elevator access that was, they used them to store uh, trash cans, boxes, vacuum cleaners, all kinds of things. In one case, it was an auditorium with no access to the stage, only steps. Uh, rooms that people need to get into were locked. There were no ADA compliant bathrooms. That would mean toilet height, handrails, things like that. Even getting into the building was sometimes impossible. There'd be a threshold of several inches in the front of the building people couldn't even get in. Okay, and for our library, which is a little bit differently, so I didn't include them in that general statement, they had book sales outside in inaccessible locations. In the children's room, the, the aisles between the racks of books were too narrow. That, that violates the ADA. Also, I'm, a, I'm an addicted person who goes to Marshalls, which is a nice shopping place. They also did not meet code at 36 inches because the base of their, um, their racks were closed were 36 inches, but the clothes hung out in the middle. I was always knocking them off with my wheelchair. So um, there are requirements for aisles. And at the library, we also have a problem with, um, there's an alarm device so that people don't steal books and things. It's very narrow, it's hard to get in and out in a wheelchair and you can't even reach the elevator button. You have to use my cane to get there. Uh, in our polling places in Braintree, uh, which of course are all required to be accessible, um, there was no accessible parking in some, some of the sites. There were no access ramps in the building. There was a denial of alternate means of, of voting, like the automark machine, which is legally required. Um, people with disabilities have the right to choose someone to assist them during voting if they want. That right was often denied us. 
Um, so those are some of some of the problems that we encountered in brain two with our um, our polling places. Uh, and also we had problems with people having getting transportation to the polling places, which comes not under the town of Braintree, but under our Metropolitan Boston Transit Authority. For outdoor events, we had one problem, and I was actually on the front page of our local paper about this as a wheelchair person. They have to have accessible mats to get you to different areas of the outdoor event. And the accessible mats were not installed properly. They're all buckled and a, a tripping hazard in people's wheelchairs. So that must be done. Uh, the town of Braintree, and I assume that's true for all cities and towns, also has responsibility over commercial entities in town. They have to do licensing and inspection that they meet the ADA requirements. And some of the problems that we found in Braintree, uh, which were not um, compliant, were that the, the location itself was inaccessible. There was no passive travel. There was no park, HP parking. The counter was too high for people to reach. There was no bathroom access and in a restaurant. That some of the, these uh, businesses had outdoor events and beyond a grass hill, which is inaccessible to people in wheelchairs, things like that. Another big important area in general is parking. The town must provide ADA compliant parking spaces for all town buildings and town owned parking lots. We found our municipal parking lot had an insufficient number, according to the regulation, of you know, HB or handicapped parking spots, and the lack of enforcement people who were not handicapped were using those spots. Um, so, and the town also is responsible for on street parking for businesses. The town must maintain existing on street accessible parking, and they often did that. Same two kinds of uh, violations, not enough of these regulations, and they did not enforce. We found the police were not enforcing illegal parking of people who didn't need HP spots using. Now, a really big issue for people like me in wheelchairs is sidewalk access. This is a town wide issue, and I'm going to give you some example what we call lack of maintenance of accessible features. Accessible features would be the sidewalks themselves, the, the curb cuts, um, things like that. What we found is that back right in my neighborhood, I have to go on the street all the time. Um, there's bumps, there's lips, there's big dips of the, the slope. There's, I don't know the exact requirement, it doesn't matter, but there are requirements for slope. Uh, for people in wheelchairs, it cannot be too much of an angle, it's illegal. Uh, there were pedestrian lights, but there were no light bulbs in them, so there was no light, it was unsafe at night. Uh, in the sidewalks themselves, sometimes there were utility covers with storm drains that were, you could, were a tripping hazard for your wheelchairs. Uh, the, the material they were using was broken. Uh, we had telephone poles coming up in the middle. We had tree roots coming up in the middle. And again, th there is a, uh, a requirement for sidewalk width, which, and some of the sidewalks are too narrow to be compliant. Then with the sidewalks, we had a lot of blockages. Those were actual issues for the sidewalks themselves. We had block, we had people park their cars on our sidewalk, cars hang out of the driveway on our sidewalk. Businesses were obstructing the sidewalks with signage. And people waiting to get into the rest and hope stacks of people. Uh, there was snow that was not removed. Our brain tree does not require people in town to shovel their own sidewalks, which is a serious problem. It's not a local requirement. We have trash cans, yard waste, gravel, all kinds of debris. Very hard to get down the street. And when construction was being done in a neighborhood, whether it was private or town, we often had construction equipment as well blocking. For curb cuts, the problems we had, we had two types of problems, curb cuts, access and safety. Under access, they were missing. There was no curb cut at all. Or it was in bad condition. Again, it was a tripping hazard for a wheelchair. Snow and storm drain, similar to the sidewalk. For safety, they were too steep, or they were not firm and stable. They were, they were slipping, or the transition to the crosswalk was uh, not correct. And one thing we did discover is that when the curb cut is not aligned exactly correctly, with the crosswalk, people who don't see well, blind or visually impaired, can walk right into light poles and other things. Um, as far as the crosswalks themselves, the issues we had in terms of, we had 171 violations in our lawsuit, by the way. Um, the crosswalk buttons were not being named in an operable condition, and there was no accessible, that means voice, you know, for people who are visually impaired, pedestrian signals, which is required by law. Now I'll move on to town parks. And this refers to all public parks owned by the town right now. It's also required to have accessible playground equipment, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, sometimes there was accessible playground equipment, but lack of an accessible pathway to get to it. They would put down wood fiber chips, wood chips, which was not firm and stable, and people were just couldn't get there. Um, there were non-compliant racks. 
around the playground equipment, no handrails, uh, a bad slope. Um, to switch you to the next page here, in my notes. Um, there was, like I said, there were actually playgrounds without inclusionary equipment, which is a problem. That meant no handicapped accessible swings, no handicapped uh, accessible slides. And one thing, uh, because we have people with disabilities and brain trees whose children are not disabled, um, that they would, but, but who need their parent to push the, the uh, let's say the swing, uh, there was no access behind the street for a disabled adult to push their child. They had inaccessible picnic tables, inaccessible bathrooms. And often, even with the children's with the parking, uh, there was no accessible parking near the, uh, near the playground. And then we discovered in one place there was a no fence right there next to a lake, which was a safety issue. And my next topic is town communication. The town websites must be accessible, have accessible website design for accessibility and usability. I'm going to divide into two categories people who are blind, have low vision, and then people who are deaf, hard of hearing, they have been deaf, blind. First category for people who are with vision impairment. Mm -hmm. All the documents, notices, agendas must be posted in digitally accessible format so people with vision issues can use screen readers. There must be tags, alt tags, long descriptions and captions. And accommodations upon request must be provided such as a person to read, large print, braille, audio, all the above. For people who have hearing impairments, uh, you, it's required that you have qualified sign language interpreters as we have today, ASL, relay services, closed captioning, cart, and again, plenty of time in advance to request accommodations for nights when the town is showing movies and things like that. Um, and then we have um, the town also has in Branch Street all kinds of uh, other account social websites, Facebook, emergency, one specific for topics like emergency preparedness, safety. And all town officials must be, uh, and officials and employees must, and, uh, and contractors must make sure that any event notifications are accessible. Um, but we found that a lot of uh, material was being uploaded into non-accessible format. No um, and the, our public library still has no screen views of the library on the way Now, here's some of the responses to our allegation the town brain she gave us. They gave us four categories. Of, this is Penny's categorization of it. Uh, things that are already, they said a lot that was already compliant. The terrain is already firm and stable. The polling places they claimed were compliant. The accessibility was provided as required. Someone else already did it. The Department of Transportation, the mass, um, the construction was completed. It's not a barrier at all. And then they said that some of they're not responsible for. It's not in town jurisdiction. It's not town property. It was not modified since the ADA. They don't have to do it. Uh, the, the police are doing their job. They are following, they are you know, monitoring that. Uh, sidewalk failure to comply with sidewalk access and parking. Then they gave us a category under review where we're thinking of moving that tree because it's in the way. Or we're thinking of moving the whole service to another building that's more accessible. And then they did admit that a lot of things they hadn't done and they told us things like in our in our in our settlement, part of project to be completed, we'll make compliant, we'll prioritize for future project, we'll be we'll build curb ramps. Uh, we agree it needs repairing. We will provide an accessible pathway. We will provide inclusion equipment. We will restructure the library book sales so they're accessible. Things like that. So, but they didn't agree with all of it on all of it. But I can't go into the details of the settlement here. It's too complicated. Um, town training, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, town is responsible for specialized training for all appointed elected officials of, of the town. Uh, now, and if, if you can't get your needs met, you have the right to grievances. The ADA does require grievances. And you can file complaints for any violation of accessibility, lack of program access, uh, lack of usability of the website. In Braintree, the, these, these complaints go directly to the ADA coordinator or the town building inspector who are required by law to do an investigation, respond, you know, issue a violation to the appropriate party, and then follow through with enforcement if, if, if the uh, failure to comply has not been resolved. Okay, now for that last part, I have a couple more minutes here, is I'd like to talk to you about what you can do to make your cities and towns accessible. You know, obviously, you become engaged as you are now as advocates, activists, become community leaders, identify what your issues are, uh, try to come up with solutions if you know what they would be, 
You can work as individuals, small groups. You can partner with other groups like Centers of Independent Living, Protection and Advocacy Organizations, get involved in direct action, you know, speaking out, um, you know, all kinds of ways. You've got doing trainings, doing workshops, filing complaints, providing technical assistance to people to help them doing writing letters. And in all these ways, you want to hold your local cities and towns accountable. Um, and uh, you need to be optimistic. Uh, you can solve problems. And when you um, do your work, you have the opportunity to hold your cities and towns accountable, I just said. You can make a difference. You can make things more accessible. You can advance inclusion. You can make systemic change. You can see that people with disabilities are not marginalized. You can ensure our right to civil and human rights. You can promote justice. You can contribute to the good of your community. And I conclude by saying that you can make change. You can see that justice is done for people with disabilities in your cities and towns. You can help create a better future in a world where people with disabilities can live with dignity and quality of life. Thank you for asking me to speak to you today. I'm done. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for sharing your personal experiences with injustice and accessibility and advocacy, as well as providing information about how we can advocate for creating accessible and accommodating environments in our own community. Um, this right. is Maya this speaking. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Penny. No, just thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Maya speaking, and next panelist, Colin Killick, Executive Director at Disability Policy Consortium, and Lori Seedman, my Budsman Director of Deaf Services at Disability Policy Consortium, will share about the importance of ASL interpretation and healthcare access. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Colin Killick. I am a white man uh, in my early 30s. I have uh, curly brown hair and beard. I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf and a Hamilton poster. Um, so I'm going to speak briefly about accessibility um, and discrimination in healthcare in general, and then turn over to Lori to discuss the specific issue of ASL interpretation. Um, so in particular, our organization, we do disability rights advocacy and much of it focuses on healthcare. And people with disabilities encounter barriers to fair and equitable healthcare in a, a myriad variety of ways. Um, sheer inaccessibility is one of them. Um, there are still many doctor's offices that are inaccessible, uh, particularly um, OBGYN um, offices and dentist offices are especially likely to be inaccessible, um, which means people with disabilities often cannot get care in those contexts. Um, within offices, often uh, doctor's offices do not have accessible scales, meaning that people who are wheelchair users are rarely weighed, um, which can cause issues. Um, People with disabilities often um, are not provided with good um, reproductive health services out of a mistaken uh, presumption that people with disabilities do not have sex lives, um, which leads to uh, a whole range of issues. Um, there's the problem of diagnostic overshadowing, which is the phenomenon in which people with mental health diagnoses receive poor care for their physical health because symptoms of physical ailments are wrongly ascribed to their mental health diagnosis. We hear stories all the time of people who go to the doctor with you know, pain or um, an infection or, so, or you know, something of that nature, heart issues, and are told, oh, well, you, this, you have this mental health diagnosis. That must be what's going on. Um, and then there was something which came up again and again in the context of the pandemic. And that is simply that unfortunately too often in our healthcare system, uh, the lives of people with disabilities themselves are not valued. There is a presumption out there, one really not backed up by data, um, that people with disabilities, our lives are inherently less worth living, less worth saving. Um, and that plays out in policy in a variety of ways. Um, there was a study by Lisa Iazzoni, who's a um, doctor at the Mongan Institute for Health Policy at MGH, that came out, um, um, which, showed that physicians have often have negative views of people with this, of the quality of life of people with disabilities and that just 40.7% uh, of the physicians surveyed felt very confident about their ability to provide the same quality of care 
the patients with disabilities as their other patients. Uh, and so this is really a problem for our healthcare system. It's a problem that really reared its head during COVID when even our state's own crisis standards of care policies um, deprioritized people with disabilities so that we would go to the back of the line for ventilators and hospital beds. Um, fortunately, our organization, along with others, led the fight to overturn those standards and replace them with non-discriminatory ones. Um, but I think it points to um, a real fundamental problem in the way that our healthcare system functions in that people with disabilities are written off. We're treated like a failed health outcome. So much focus is put on preventing disability that once someone has a disability, uh, they're treated like, well, there's nothing more we can do for them. And that's that's really an issue. It's something our organization fights to change and would encourage everyone here to become more involved in. Um, if you'd like to know more about DPC and our work and more involved in our advocacy, you can check out our website, which is dpcma.org or send an email to advocacy at dpcma.org. And now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Lori, to talk more specifically about the importance of ASL interpretation. This is Lori, bear with me just one second. I'm going to get my screen organized. Okay, hello to everybody. Thank you for your attention. My name is Lori Steedman. I'm the Director of Deaf Services um, at Maya Ombudsman. I have brown curly hair and wearing glasses. I am a deaf woman using an interpreter named Rachel. Um, uh, she will be uh, translating into English what I'm saying in ASL. Um, so the uh, My Ombudsman program, as Colin mentioned, is under the DPC, the Disability po Policy Consortium. And our mission, uh, the mission of My Ombudsman is under the operation of the independent nonprofit to empower individuals and mass health members and their families to understand their rights and access to their managed care plans. Um, so we operate with a relationship under those programs so people understand what their rights are. The people that we serve are people who are mass health members who may not have an understanding about um, how they can work with that system. They don't understand necessarily what their rights are or how to access them. So we provide support as a liaison between the two organizations and we help to make sure that the system is working appropriately for the various people who take advantage of it and our members. And so that's the idea of the My Ombudsman program generally is that folks can access the needs that they naturally have. Um, for the program of mass health. Specifically though, my ombudsman works under a policy of cultural competency. So I, as the director of deaf services, was the first deaf person given a my ombudsman role in the country. Uh, and that's because I operate with the lived experience of a deaf person, as well as having the cultural competency of the education that I have as well. So just some basic information about deaf people. Um, I can't go into too much detail because we have limited time, but I can give you general information. If you're interested in more detail after the fact, I have my contact information at the end of the slides as well. And so I'm happy to share with you uh, on a more one-to-one -one level if that's helpful. On the first top of the slide, we see the word deaf with a capital D. Those are people who identify culturally as deaf, who use primarily American Sign Language to communicate. Then we have lowercase d, folks who may have a hearing disability as well, but don't primarily use sign language or identify culturally with the deaf community. Next on the list, we have hard of hearing. Those are people who have residual hearing at various levels and typically rely on that hearing to communicate with the world. Um, we know that those, you know, again, those various le those levels vary, but um, people who may hear well enough to get along in the world on a hearing level, but may have gaps in their understanding and so may have various results on their audiogram. But typically people who identify as hard of hearing do again have residual hearing, do have the ability to speak and would not identify as members of the deaf community. Um, people who, op who identify as members of the deaf community with a capital D typically use American Sign Language to communicate, as I said, and people who op uh, identify with a lowercase d often don't use sign language, um, whereas people who are hard of hearing can, I can do both or sometimes one or the other. 
At the bottom of the slide, we see late deafened, and those are people who are born with full hearing and full access to auditory language and lose their hearing over time or at a later age. So people who identify as late deafened could have lost their hearing when they were two or 13 or 50 over the course of the lifespan. Um, and it can cause a variety of different results as well. Um, those hearing losses can happen as a result of illness or infection. There can be physical accidents that happen or medication can cause ototoxic reactions as well. So there's a lot of reasons somebody might become late deafened. That's another population that we serve. So again, this is gonna be very um, basic information because of a lack of time here, but generally speaking, it's helpful to know about the style of communication for folks who identify as deaf and hard of hearing. It may depend on the school that they grew up in. It may depend on who their teachers were, who their families were, and what access to language they had in the home. Um, you know, if a, if a child is deaf who grows up in a family where no one signs, for example, they may struggle. If they end up in a residential school for deaf children, they may have the opportunity to live their lives in education in American Sign Language and have full access. So there's such a wide variety of lived experience among the deaf and hard of hearing community um, that can really affect the way a person chooses to communicate in adulthood. But in terms of, of communication access needs that you might be thinking about, um, we're using American Sign Language interpreters today. You've seen Rachel and Kelly, and in, at the moment, Rachel is translating into English what I'm telling you in American Sign Language. So interpreters work in, in those directions as well to facilitate communication between folks who sign and folks who do not. Uh, at the bottom of this slide, we see certified deaf interpreter, and that is deaf to deaf communication. Uh, People who are certified as deaf interpreters are deaf themselves and often trained in the more nuanced understanding of maybe more gestural communication. It can happen, of course, that because of the variety of lived experiences, deaf people may not be able to, to have communications easily with um, hearing, in, hearing interpreters or hearing providers. And so it may be, for example, if I give the example of a deaf person who's going to CVS to the pharmacy to want something for a rash, they may be wanting to ask for something as easy as Benadryl, but not know the name of the product of Benadryl or not know that it exists. They wouldn't know the word necessarily antihistamine. And so having a sign language interpreter there who didn't have the nuance and access of lived experience as a deaf interpreter may not be as effective as a deaf interpreter who can explain things more visually and be able to interpret that conversation in a way that's more accessible. Generally speaking, if uh, you know a person has a doctor's appointment or they're going to a meeting, then it's very important to have an interpreter there. So CDIs most often work in tandem with hearing interpreters, but again, that's a detail that would be determined by the preferences of the person you're working with. We also have communication access real-time translation, what's known colloquially as CART, which is a live person using uh, basically a court reporting system in order to provide captions live in the moment. And that can be useful for people who are hard of hearing or who rely on the English uh, without being able to auditorily ex access it. Um, it can be better for people who are hard of hearing or who struggle with their hearing in order to try to understand everything that's being said. They can rely on those captions either to work in, in coupling with their own hearing or if they don't have hearing at all, um, to be able to access the actual English words being spoken. There's also tactile interpreting, which is for people who are deaf blind. People who are deaf and blind who may use tactile communication as a result of not being able to rely on their vision to use sign language um, at a distance. So uh, we also have folks who are deafblind who identify as preferring close vision, which would mean they would just need to sit at a very close distance with a sign language or deaf interpreter. At the bottom of the screen, we see oral English or spoken English interpreter, and that would be typically for someone who's um, who's deaf or hard of hearing, but who doesn't use sign language, who would prefer to sit in front of an interpreter who would merely be repeating what is being said. Um, maybe in a doctor's office, the particular provider is difficult to understand or has facial features that make lip reading difficult. Also, if you're in a situation like a larger conference where the speaker is at quite a distance or you're not able to access them because of the, the, the jumbotron or what have you, then to have an interpreter sitting in front of a person who relies on oral interpretation would just be repeating verbally what's being said and they can read their lips at a close distance. This slide uh, indicates a couple of the different options that there are for communication options for deaf and hard of hearing people. At the top, we see video phone. Now we know, of course, that people like different kinds of communication access technology, depending on what their needs are, depending on what their preferences are. Again, on the very first bullet point here is the video phone, which is a very, very common feature of many signing deaf people's lives. 
because what it means is that I see on a screen either an interpreter or a deaf person like myself, and we can just sign back and forth to one another, um, and it's visually accessible. So that's a very, very popular feature. Uh, secondly, we see CapTel and also caption call, and then thirdly, clear caption. And those are options that are very similar to one another. And then they provide access for people who don't hear well, but can still speak to be on the telephone with other hearing people. And so they speak into the receiver and what they see on the back end, if they can't hear the, the other person on the call, is that they read the captions of what the person is saying. It's also available mobily, so you can have it at home. You can also be able to read the captions on your mobile device if you're out and about. So having those options is really great for people who rely on captions um, and CapTel is quite a popular one of those. Amplified phones are for people again, who can use the phone, but it's an additional, um, additional piece of equipment to increase the volume of those phone units. Video remote interpreting, VRI, as opposed to video relay services is much more commonly seen in places like social security offices and doctor's office doctor's offices, and they're doing that because when deaf people come for appointments and they don't have interpreters available or they just walk in, they're able to turn on VRI and have access to an interpreter in real time. Um, it's, it's easier in many cases to have the interpreter. Um, some of those offices have that available all the time and others can bring it in. And then at the bottom of the screen, we see TTY, um, which is honestly being phased out. It's pretty old fashioned technology at this point, but there are some people in the community who still use it. Some deaf blind people, people who are of an older generation who may still prefer to use the TTY. Um, we're, like I said, we're seeing more VRS, we're seeing more video phones in the younger generations. And so TTY is really being phased out, but it does still exist and you might hear about it. Um, what it is, is a, basically a typewriting machine. So you can caption back and forth a phone call with the person you're talking to. And there is a relay up operator involved as well. So I might be typing, then the captioned, or excuse me, the relay operator will read what I'm typing and hear your message and then type it back to me. Uh, IP relay at the bottom of the screen is another one of those options involving a third person or relay operator. So the process takes quite a long time and happens in the medium of English, as opposed to people like myself who prefer to communicate in ASL, who can do that directly um, over a video phone. So again, these are just some of the options. It's not an exhaustive list, and it'll really depend on the nature of the person's preference and the nature of their appointment or conversation, which they prefer to use. This is another list of technology options for deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, I've just been speaking particularly about phones, uh, video phones and auditory amplification devices. These are things people can use to increase their, their residual hearing. Um, so we know that, you know, People may feel, maybe they feel safer in an environment where they can hear things if they consider themselves hard of hearing, but other people prefer to have things quite quiet depending on their own personal preferences. So if people can hear well, um, they may use hearing aids, they may or may not. Um, secondarily, we see FM systems, which uh, is a device that can be worn around the chest. And then a microphone is passed to the speaker in the room and those two devices speak to each other over Bluetooth. So maybe in a conference, a person who is hard of hearing who wouldn't hear well because of the din of the other people at the conference could provide the microphone to the speaker and be able to have direct access through the FM system. Um, infrared systems and loop systems are very similar ideas so that larger rooms can be wired for sound for people who are hard of hearing. Uh, TV ears at the in the middle of the slide. Um, Maybe your grandparents or your great grandparents, you know, you might be people, you might have people in your family who are frustrating to you because they watch television at such loud volumes. As we get older, people often lose their hearing. And so they, TV ears was invented to be basically looks like a hearing aid and the people who are needing the amplification of the television can have that particular volume just for, for themselves personally without having to bother other people in the rooms. So that's, that's typically hard of hearing folks or age related hearing loss folks. So people can watch television to Together without everyone having to sort of suffer the volume of the older person. And then at the bottom of this slide, we see alerting devices and signaling systems. Um, there are visual doorbells, there are fire alarms, uh, uh, door knockers, things like that, baby crying systems as well for people who can't easily access the sound of their baby crying. So, and, and we see these used quite often for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Maybe they prefer those alarms to be visual. Maybe they're visual and amplified sound as well. If the phone is ringing, um, they may not be aware that somebody is knocking on the door. So there's lots of different ways that those alarms can be made either visual or physical tactile can be done with vibration as well. 
these are just some of the options that people use in their homes for safety and access. Um, I have a particular alarm um, that I've heard of that is a vibration in the bed. You can wake up from a night's sleep using a visual alarm, using a vibration alarm, those kinds of things. This slide talks about working effectively with deaf and hard of hearing people and things that we've learned over my particular tenure as my ombudsman. I've been there in, in various capacities um, since for about three years. Now, initially I was the my ombudsman track for deaf and hard of hearing people and have since been promoted. Um, I became the director of deaf services about a year ago. Uh, and we operate within, a, again, a context of cultural competency. So myself as a deaf person with lived experience means that I can work with other deaf and deafblind individuals because I understand where they're coming from and what their concerns might be. Um, I can communicate directly with deaf and hard of hearing people in their preferred language in order to facilitate that relationship with mass health, as I mentioned. So things are more accessible, things are easier because there's not that need to explain cross-culturally how they feel or what they need. And I also have a good sense of the, res the resources in both the deaf community and the wider mass health community. So I can make those connections a little bit easier because of my lived experience. In terms of collaboration, we work often with deaf and hard of hearing independent living services, which is uh, colloquially, co colloquially known as DILS. And DILS has some deaf services as well under the auspices of EOHHS. We see Mass Health, um, uh, the Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, MCDHH, offers quite a variety of services, Department of Mental Health, DDS, as well as the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. Each of them operate with a DILS program as well, and they have either deaf coordinators or people who are familiar with deaf and hard of hearing culture in order to make those relationships more effective as well in terms of communication. Um, and generalized access. So again, folks can, can take advantage of the rights that they have to these services. This is another slide about uh, organizations that we collaborate with. One particularly is serving the health insurance needs of everyone known as SHINE. We also work with deaf and hard of hearing nonprofits and grassroots programs, uh, which would be like, uh, deaf respite programs and also various groups that exist around the state like the Massachusetts State Association of the Deaf, the Western Mass State Association of the Deaf. There are Facebook groups for folks in the deaf and hard of hearing community, Google groups, things like that. And so I keep my, my fingers in those pies as well so that I know what's happening when folks come to me with questions. This is our contact information for the My Ombudsman program under DPC. If you have access uh, or benefit struggles with mass health, please feel free to contact us or give this number out to other people. Um, the phone number there, the 855 number, um, will connect you to someone who could do an intake and then you'll be assigned to someone who can work and coordinate within your particular case. You'll be referred to someone who can work with your particular needs. So don't feel like you have to call and know exactly what you need before you call us. We'll figure it out with you. Um, secondly, you see the video phone number. That's my direct line if you're referring or using for yourself deaf and hard of hearing services. That's the email, generally email, and the website as well for my ombudsman. Keep in mind, our website will be revamped. We're working on it now, so it's pretty old at this point. It might be hard to navigate, but it will be updated very shortly, so, so bear with us about that. I also wanted to spend just a couple of minutes here showing you some resources. Um, what I can do is email this out. If you're interested, please feel free to reach out to me. I can send this to you. I'll just give it to you very quickly. Um, we had talked about VRI, for example, and so I wanted to give you a, a sense of what some of the companies are out there that you might hear about for VRI. We have Purple Communications, we have Sorensen Communications, um, and um, these are companies that operate nationally as well. If you need to uh, request communication access, either through an ASL interpreter, a deaf interpreter, or CART, um, I wanted to give you the address and phone number for the Commission for the Deaf and Art of Hearing, which has a referral service. We have Partners Interpreting, uh, the Learning Center for the Deaf, which operates a referral service as well, and then Sorensen Communication. Um, so depending on your needs, you can reach out to any of these places to fulfill communication access requirements. And here's some general information. Again, this is how you would get in touch with the Commission for the Deaf and Art of Hearing. And that could be either to request interpreters or CART, 
or for case management services, and then in-service or educational training um, for more detailed information about how to work with deaf clients or get access services for people in the deaf community. Just a little bit more general information, the Massachusetts State Association of the Deaf, which I mentioned, the website is listed here. And secondly, the Western Mass Association for the Deaf has a website also. DILS programs also operate regionally around the state, depending on the community where the person lives. Um, I, I, our office is in the Eastern part of the state. So the Western part of the state has um, CLW, the Center for Living and Working, um, the eastern part of the state has Deaf Inc. We also have an organization called Viability, which you can see here on this slide, operates in the Western Mass uh, region and also the Berkshires. And this is a little bit more about assistive technology. Um, deaf uh, DILS programs, the hard of hearing, Deaf and Hard of Hearing Independent Living Services programs can be very helpful if you're working with Deaf and Hard of Hearing people who are interested in technology but might not know what they need yet. Um, so, Again, we see Massachusetts or uh, MCDHH, uh, EOHHS, Deaf Inc. These are very helpful places. Um, you know, sometimes we operate under limits around what we're allowed to provide services for. For example, people who are deaf blind are, are mandated to be served by MCB, the Mass Commission for the Blind. Well, we know the ins and outs of that. So again, just reach out to us and we can help you navigate the system. In terms of assistive technology, uh, people can apply for that through the Easter Seals of Massachusetts program. Um, Mass EDP, the equipment distribution program is another way to get telephones for free or for reduced cost. Those captels, those captioned telephones, those are free of cost to people who need them. Sorensen is another operation that might be helpful to get assistive technology. Uh, and for specific uh, caption telephones, these are places that you can uh, apply. These are websites or phone numbers that you can access in order to get this equipment, which will be free as well. The mass uh, equipment distribution program that I mentioned is the, is the way that these, these pieces of equipment are distributed to people. Um, and so, you know, you could, uh, often what would happen is if you hadn't had that free assistance, oh, excuse me, the, the equipment may be free, but the calls may cost. It would depend on the program that you utilize. And that's what I had. Um, so I know that's a lot of information, kind of an information dump to get everything uh, all in one setting and so quickly. So if you're interested, please feel free to call us. We're happy to talk through anything um, with you at any time. This is Maya speaking. Uh, thank you so much, Colin, for sharing about the disparities in healthcare and Lori for just now sharing about DPC's role in Massachusetts, sharing tons of terminology and com communication and technology options for the deaf and hard of hearing community, as well as emphasizing the role of cultural co competency and how that plays a role in your work. And also, um, I get, thank you again for the plethora of excellent resources. This is Maeve. Now panelist Heather Mays, a special education teacher, Dr. Ann Brady, a high school special education teacher, and Becky Bonafont, HW Special Education Parent Advisory Council Chair, will discuss special education now and in the future and different types of special education. Hello, my name is Heather Mace. I am a white woman with brown hair to my shoulders and black rectangular glasses and a purple shirt. And I'm in a uh, room with white walls. Oh, I'm Ann Brady. I am a white woman with clear glasses and curly red hair. And I am sitting in front of a green wall. Hi, I'm Becky Bonifant. I, on your screen, am a white woman. I'm sitting in front of a light gray room. Uh, my hair is pulled back with a red headband and I am in a black and gray shirt. What is special education? As we're talking about it in our part of the presentation, special education means this is Anne, by the way. Special education means specially designed instruction at no cost to the parents to meet the unique needs of a child with a disability as provided, I should say, by the public school system. It is, this is the definition that exists on the IDEA website, which stands for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act website. Um, 
which is the law that put into place special education as we know it in the United States. An individual, an IEP, which is a term that we often hear thrown around in the jargon of special education, refers to an individual education program or the specific learning path that's designed with the student's strengths and challenges in mind. This is Heather speaking. Uh, IDEA stands for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Uh, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is a law that makes available a free, appropriate public education to eligible children with disabilities throughout the nation and ensures special education and related services to those children. And it has the website here, which we can list on the YouTube channel. Before this act, it was common for many children with, with disabilities to be denied access into a public school. So this was a, a way for children to be included within the public education system. So what do we mean by this idea of free appropriate public education, which is often called FAPE in the jargon? This means that students are entitled to a specifically designed instructional program that meets their needs, including all the related services that they might need to access the curriculum, and that they're entitled to an individualized educational program. The way that eligibility is determined is through an assessment uh, process that starts with the parent um, requesting that their child be evaluated and the child is then assessed and observed in school. And after eligibility is determined, the special education team gets together and determines this individualized education program. And the next slide talks about how we have to try to um, provide this education in the least restrictive environment. And Heather is going to present that slide. Hello, this is Heather again. So on this slide, we have a cartoon of a man standing on a ladder with multiple rungs. And the title of the cartoon is Least Restrictive Environment, L-R-E. On the bottom rung, it says residential, students permanently reside at their school for special needs. The next rung up, it says separate school, students attend school specifically for students with disabilities. The next rung up, it says self-contained. Students are taught by special education teachers with other special education students only. Uh, sec almost at the top, it says resource room. Students are pulled out of their regular classes to meet with a resource teacher. Next, it says inclusion. Special ed teacher supports with the general ed classroom. And at the very top, it says general education classes, no supports. So through practices like universal design for learning, we can keep students at the top part of the ladder in the least restrictive environment. We wanna keep people with their peers, with their community, and we wanna stay on that top rung. This is Anne speaking again. So Heather and I are both in agreement that we think special education um, will not, hopefully will not be a, a separate field eventually that we are working toward hopefully having full inclusion. And that the, the way to get to that is through the implementation of universal design for learning and designing our lessons and our curriculum with the margins completely in mind, not with the average student in mind, because there frankly is no average student in reality. Um, and that by designing um, our curriculum with multiple means of engagement and multiple means of 
representation and multiple means of action and expression, we can serve every student who comes into our school and our classrooms without having to have separate settings and um, supports in a resource room. Um, in addition, teachers um, have at their fingertips in every single district, a district um, curriculum accommodation plan that lists multiple, multiple myriad accommodations that should be provided to every student to make the curriculum more accessible. And teachers, we think, um, have a ways to go and can become much more proficient at impl implementing these on a regular basis for all students. And it will make um, the general education classroom more accessible for everyone. Uh, the last point I want to speak about is the, uh, that the concepts of blended learning uh, would go a long way toward helping make uh, the general education classroom more inclusive for all students and all learners, no matter what their um, learning style is and what, what their learning differences are. Um, the blended learning classroom is one that uses a self-paced mastery-based instructional model that leverages technology to foster human connection, authentic learning, and social emotional growth. It enhances the sense of inclusion and engagement of all students by making the class less teacher-centered and having students drive the pace of their learning through teacher-designed units with teacher support but all students have the time they need to learn and are appropriately engaged and challenged when they need to be. In addition, learners progress to more advanced material when they are ready for it, not on the teacher-driven timetable for a specific class period. So it's a way that uh, learning can be more student-paced and not allow students to feel like they fall behind if they're not right um, on the, the mark with every other person in their classroom. Heather? Yes, so um, I wanted to also talk about a few points in the slide and mentioned using accommodations within the classroom. I believe all schools have something called a DCAP, which is a list of accommodations that general education teachers can use within their classroom. These accommodations allow flexibility for different types of learners to be included. And it's really just good teaching practices and list form. Um, also on the slide, it mentions double certified teachers. Uh, it's now becoming more in practice for uh, special ed teachers to have another content area that they're licensed in. And then um, there's also a transition from special education to inclusion education. I have a, a coworker who has her master's in inclusion education. Um, I think good teaching is good teaching and a teacher works with the students in front of um, them, him, her, them, and they will be able to just uh, take their skills and make it work. And so I think eventually what will happen is um, teachers will just be teachers and it'll be less about having the special education teacher and more about the teacher working with their skill set. And um, also there's um, right now there's a real push for a greater understanding of neurodiversity. Uh, hopefully after now that we're in this stage where we're really re-examining schools, we'll, we're looking at how we can make schools a more inclusive space to really reflect that neurodiversity. And hopefully through that, there'll be a greater support for atypical learners and also um, more of a focus on social emotional well-being. Right. There's really, this is Anne speaking again, there's really a need for um, all teachers to uh, focus on social emotional well-being of their students and have trauma, a trauma-centered um, approach to teaching and to acknowledge that there are a, a, there's a range of emotional disabilities that we are encountering in our work um, and that it's the job of all teachers to help um, 
foster the learning of those students. At the school in particular that I work at, we have a very large proportion of students who are qualifying for special education due to emotional concerns. Um, but the, uh, the level of emotional cons concerns is spreading wider throughout the student body. And um, it, it's not just a special ed issue, it's a school-wide issue that, need, that teachers need to be able to focus and be um, there for students who have social emotional concerns. Hi, this is Becky. I wanted to introduce you to the CPAC for those not already familiar. The CPAC is a Special Education Parent Advisory Council. CPACs are actually legally required of every district in the state of Massachusetts. That's not the case for every other state. But even in uh, other states where it's not required, they do often have them because they have really seen the value. So we're lucky here to have them uh, required of each district. And I chair ours in Hamilton Wenham. The CPAC sits under the school committee. We actually have a small budget, which we use for programming, which is at the approval of the school committee. But other than that, we really run independently. We do follow um, an open meeting law with uh, posting agendas and our minutes, and we have elected um, officials. Membership is open really to anybody who's interested in disability in Hamilton Wenham. This is a change uh, that we made in the bylaws a few years ago. It was previously, you had to be a parent or caregiver of somebody in the district, but we thought even, you know, in my case where my kids are, may eventually not be students in the district, perhaps I still wanna participate. And we wanted it to be open to people, um, even if they didn't have enrolled students, if they were still interested in disability and Hamilton Wenham to be able to participate. It represents all families of children with disability, regardless of school. That includes out of district placements where you are a resident of Hamilton or Wenham, but perhaps with a limitation of, um, the offering of the schools in the district, you needed to be placed um, at a school outside of town. And that would still be included in the scope of the CPAC. So this is different than um, a friends of or like a PTO because those groups would likely just look at the interest of their one school. So the friends of Winthrop, for example, would just be looking at the interest of the Winthrop School, whereas this group is looking at all of the schools. The goal for the group is really, as you know, I've listed encouraging understanding, acceptance, and inclusion within the district of students with disabilities. So I'm meeting regularly with school officials, um, most specifically with the Director of Student Services to participate in planning, development, evaluation of the district's uh, special education programs. It advises school leaders on any unmet needs through identified uh, parental input. So for example, in the last year or two that I can think of, it was uh, if events were you know, pizza or ice cream socials, that might be difficult for kids who have severe food allergies to participate in. So could we have non-food times? Or in, in one instance, we were contracting an occupational therapy service. And could we look at bringing somebody on staff to better meet the needs of the students? It also is providing educational opportunities for the Hamilton Wenham community at large on topics related to special education and generally the safety of students with disabilities. Every year that does legally need to include a parent's rights workshop where we just go through the evaluation process and what rights parents do have to special education in the district. So as I said, that happens once every year, otherwise, I really base the content on what I'm hearing that people want to hear. So this past year, there was a big um, presentation on executive functioning or anxiety in the wake of the, the pandemic. Those were interests um, you know, that, that our parents had, had raised. And so we had brought uh, presentations on those topics to the district. Really on a more day-to-day, -day, it's a trusted source for parents who may need information, support, and resources from their school. So 
um, you know, where do I start if I just received a diagnosis? What do I do if my child is having trouble with anxiety? Those are kind of some places, you know, areas where people come to me to ask where, where they start with the school, where they start with um, an evaluation process for obtaining a program. Um, and more casually, as sort of that trusted source, in addition to these official presentations um, and the more formal meetings, there are kind of coffee talks and, um, you know, as I said, more informal gatherings to be supportive um, in this area. So that is at a high level what the CPAC is working on in the town. You can see us on uh, Facebook at HWCPAC. We also are on the district website, which is at hwschools.net under um, district information and student services. This is Maeve speaking. Thank you, Anne and Heather, for sharing terms about special education and telling us about the different types of specialized education students can receive, as well as your hopes for more inclusive classrooms in schools. Thank you, Becky, for sharing more about CPAC. This is Maya speaking. Uh, finally, I'd like to introduce Dania Costa, uh, who is a true member mentorship coordinator at the Lynn Family Resource Center and who will talk about what it's like to live with a disability. Danny, it looks like you're on mute. Okay, can you guys hear me and see me now? Yes. yes. Awesome, all right. All right, thank you very much. And uh, man, can we just give an applause to all the people that have been speaking today and are amazing and awesome interpreters. I think they've been doing an amazing job, guys. That's really good. And I wanna thank the millions of you that are joining us. And by millions, I mean the eight of you on Facebook, the 20 something of us on the Zoom call, and maybe the 10,000 of you on YouTube. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun. I don't know about you guys. My name is Danny Acosta. I am the True Mentorship Coordinator in Lynn Family Resource Center. And I have a privilege and an honor to be able to share my experience as a blind uh, and also a kidney transplant patient individual with you. I'm going to share a little bit about my experience with school. And before I jump into it, I also want to acknowledge, um, and let me just pause. Let me just pause. I am your ASL interpreter. And although there are two of us on this call right now, I am the best one of the two. There are millions of ASL interpreters around the world, but the one that you see here is the best. So you're welcome. With that said, I hope that made some of you smile. If you get it, you get it. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about my experience. So some of you might be wondering, well, what is it actually like to be blind, right? Well, I haven't always been blind. I grew up and eventually I lost my sight as a young adult. It literally happened in three weeks, okay? When completely blind in three weeks from not having any eye issues to complete blindness. And I also got chronic kidney failure. I was on dialysis for six years until I received a kidney transplant. But in the midst of all of that, I had several, several surgeries. In seven months when I got blind, I had 19 surgeries. I was hospitalized 13 times, had a stroke, two seizures, and even had both of my eyes removed. Difficult, extreme. But I wanna share with you, by faith and not by sight. We all go through three different things. And I wanna share three points with you that I hope will be able to encapsulate my experience for all of you. Process, perseverance, and purpose. Right now, I am actually a published author, a poet, a spoken word artist, and I mentor young guys from ages eight to 18. And you're probably asking, well, how is this possible if you're completely blind? you probably go to a special blind school, right? Mm, I know some of you have probably heard that. How do you read your books? Oh, you pro they probably take it easy on you because you have a disability. No, I had to do APA formatting, MLA formatting, just like all of you. You see all the heads nodding up and down? Yup, that's right. It's not that easy. I have to do everything you have to do. It just takes me a little longer to do it, but I can sure do it. Because we all go through a process. See guys, I graduated from North Shore Community College 
in Massachusetts with a 3.94 GPA and was commencement speaker for graduation of class of 2018. I was Salem State University graduate, also commencement speaker in 2021, this year with a 3.9 GPA. But I didn't do it alone because nobody does. So let me share with you some of the processes that I went through with my experience, having to do television and radio as a completely blind individual, having to know where is the camera, having to know where are certain areas, my microphone, where am I supposed to look at? When people wanna take pictures with you, but they point the camera and they don't tell you you're looking the wrong direction or your eyes are closed. And that's just in school. That's even before starting. That's not to mention the, uh, the headaches of the ride, how on time and punctual those guys are, right? <laughs> and the inaccessibility of when they can't find you, you can't find them. They never answer the phone when you need them, right? And that's just trying to get to school. And then you get there and you're a brand new student. You're trying to figure out the map. Maybe you had some orientation and mobility training, but all of a sudden you go into the building, guess what? There's a fair for all organizations. Now you have to figure out the labyrinth. How in the world do I navigate a labyrinth that I've never learned before? A brand new map, processes. What process are you going through right now? What is the difficulty of your process? See, the difference between you and many people out there is that you know that your process is only temporary. It's not permanent. It's not forever. It's only an example of what you're capable of overcoming, doing, and breaking the barriers and the obstacles that are put before you. But my question to you is, have you given up? Or are you ready to take up your torch and say, but I'm not giving up. I'm never looking back. I'm moving forward. And if I dare look back, I will look at my reflection and remind myself of what I've gone through. Because we all go through processes. See, there's processes we go through at home as students. Sometimes your mom, maybe your parents, maybe older siblings, somebody wants to do everything for you. I'll do it. Oh, I'm going to go do this. I'll do it. Right? So to those parents listening to this, make sure you give your youth an opportunity to overcome those. For the first time, they're saying, let me put my hands on this and let me try it out. And when you take that away from them, you're taking the little effort they're willing to put in certain areas. And sometimes it's huge effort. But don't strip them away from that opportunity by saying that you can do it for them. See, I got trained at the Carroll Center for the Blind in Newton, Massachusetts, thanks to the Mass Commission for the Blind. I graduated with a bachelor's degree and an associate, completely debt-free. How many people can say that? Where are you in your finances? Well, how does he do it? How can he even read money? Well, there's technology, but we'll get to that in a moment. What about books? We all got to read textbooks in school, right? We all got to read through all of these PDF files and articles, and we all got to do the research, all of us. I'm not excluded because of my visual impairment or disability. Oh, you best bet, I was doing dialysis the entire time. Oh, yeah. Three times a week, four hours each, needles in my arm for four hours each time I was there, removing liters of toxics from my bloodstream. But there's nothing impossible. That did not hold me back. See, my, my disability is not based on my visual impairment. I am not disabled by my, dis my visual impairment. I am disabled by the things that are not made accessible to me. When a website is not accessible, that wants to bring out my disability. But it was not me who disabled me. It was not my visual impairment who disabled me. It was the inaccessibility of what people can make accessible that hold, held me back. But you know what? It's still not impossible because there is always a way. There are resources, right? What about teachers? You're doing a math class. I want you, I want you to do this exercise really quick with me. Why don't you close your eyes? Just close your eyes for a second, okay? And for those of us that are visually impaired, it's okay. And for those of you, for those of you that uh, are hard of hearing or deaf, feel free to keep your eyes open. Now, now watch, check this out. A teacher says, okay, we're gonna write the equation here and we're gonna get this number and move it this way. Then we're gonna get this variable and move it over here. 
I can't see anything she just said. I don't understand it. Feel free to open your eyes. Imagine that. The situations that we have to find ourselves sometimes without understanding in class, when they do group activities in class. And guess what? The blind guy has to just sit to the side and enjoy the moment while everybody else gets to get involved. Inaccessibility. But why do these things happen? when professors should be trained to know how to make everything accessible. Yes, even group engagement and team building. You know what's amazing too? I want you to picture this. I'm walking into a classroom. It's the beginning of the semester and I'm tapping my cane left, right, left, right, trying to find a classroom. Oh, and you best believe there's buildings out there that still don't have Braille. And they think that by having raised lettering, they solved the problem, but it hasn't because much of this raised lettering are cut up letters. And I walk into a room and everybody's laughing and joking around. But as soon as they hear my cane, guess what happens? They all quiet down as if it wasn't already weird. And then you walk in and everybody's like really quiet, just looking at you like you're some strange alien from some other universe. And you're bumping into people's backpacks and slamming books on the floor because they're falling. And I'm like, oh, excuse me. Sorry. Oh, it's OK. Oh, it's OK. But nobody even dares to get up and help you find a chair. The inaccessibility that a life has to offer is a plethora and a myriad of diversity within those that have not the guts or the courage, sometimes even the boldness. I don't know who's more disabled, the person that can't find a chair or the person that won't get up to help the person find a chair. Isn't it interesting? But I wanna encourage you because it's not all bad. Point number two, perseverance. We all need it. Every single one of you watching right now are going through a process in life, but we all need perseverance. It gets us from point A to point B. It bridges the gap between where we are to our destination, our purpose. Do you have perseverance? I want you to look at yourself in the mirror, in that camera, wherever you, any reflection that you possibly can. And if you're visually impaired, just like me, I want you to just imagine how amazing you are. And tell that person, you will not give up. You can do this. You are not disabled. You can enable others. Yes, even if you have a disability, you can enable others. It is not impossible. There are many resources in schools like disability services. Yes, there are a lot of people that don't want to go to disability services. There are plenty. But I want to encourage all of you watching right now. They are there for a purpose and a reason. They are there to be part of your team. Think of a boxing ring. A boxer after every round has to go back to his corner. Who do you have in your corner? Who is the person you go to to seek for resources? They're not going to do it for you, but they do it with you. That's what disability services is about. To enable those that have become disabled from the inaccessibility that schools have. Other resources include apps such as be My Eyes, where there are volunteers where you press a button, you call, all of a sudden a volunteer pops up on your cell phone, on your smartphone, through a camera and begins to describe to you anything and everything you need. Hey, are these the right medications I need to take? How many milligrams are there? Hey, what color is this shirt? Because I don't want to wear a blue shirt with purple pants. Are my socks mixed matching? Am I wearing... Black shoes or gray shoes? Because they're the same ones, but I don't know if they're the same color. And I don't want to mix them up. I don't want to look like a clown going to school today. It's not mix match day at universities, right? But we all have people who help us. At Salem State University, I had the amazing Jennifer McDowell who would help me every single day. At North Shore Community College, I had an amazing, uh, just a dear of a person who would also help me make all my textbooks accessible. Mass Commission for the Blind has assisted me. Carroll Center for the Blind has, oh, there's a bunch of people out there that are ready to help you and encourage you and push you forward to let you know that it is all possible. Yes, even through kidney failure and transplant. You know what, guys? Let me tell you something. My disability tried to touch my education. My disability tried to touch everything around me. My family, my blindness tried to touch my purpose. My blindness tried to strip me and take me away from being happy and joyful. But you know what it couldn't touch? It couldn't touch my purpose. It couldn't touch my life. It couldn't touch my faith because I know I'm going somewhere. 
I know that I can make it. I know it's difficult when you're the only person with a disability in your family because everyone wants to do it for you. I understand. Trust me, I'm the first blind and kidney failure person in my family. But you know what's amazing? It turns out that I'm the one motivating them. Yes, I am a motivational speaker nationwide and an evangelist. But even in the midst of all of this, I help people organize themselves. I just launched a brand new YouTube series called Envision, where I help people become organized and get prepared for school. Because why not? Why shouldn't the blind person be able to restore vision to those that are sighted but cannot understand or identify the things that are placed before them, but it seems like they're blind to it? Why shouldn't the blind help those who are sighted have vision for how to enable the things that are made inaccessible? Yeah, it took me a little more time than everybody else, but you know what? I still did it. Yes, I am blind. And although I may never be able to see you smile, I can sure make you smile. I may not have sight, but I have vision for life. And I don't want you guys to give up. Being blind, having what people call disabilities. Yeah, it's difficult. But aren't we the most resilient and adaptive people in the world? Don't we show humanity that there is still hope no matter what we go through? Don't we show all mankind and all around the earth that we are pinpoints of life on this earth, ready to transform, restore, and change the world and leave our footprint? There might be a footprint on the moon from astronauts, but what footprint are you gonna leave? What legacy will you leave on this earth? And I want to conclude with this. Here in my hands, I have a white cane. And by the way, I apologize that I didn't describe myself. I am a Latinx male. I have light skin, brown hair, blue, green, amber eyes because they're prosthetic, so I can. Yeah. And uh, just another perk, right? But here I have a white cane. Now, this white cane is completely white, has a black handle, looks painted red. It has a little marshmallow on the tip, right? <laughs> If you're hungry, I'm sorry. But what is it really? See guys, this white cane is a lot like you. You all go through processes in life. It went from an idea to paper, to different shapes, different models, different sizes. But just like you, the creators could have been like, you know what? I give up, fold it up, put it under your bed. But you had to have perseverance in life. You have to say, I'm never giving up in life. I'm not going to give up no matter what I have to encounter. Sure, I can use it as a doorstop or a weapon, <laughs> but it's not fulfilling its purpose until it takes me from point A to point B. What is your purpose? Do you know your purpose? If you're like me, your purpose just may be to motivate people and inspire people all around the world to change lives one person at a time, to restore vision to those who may be spiritually blind or blind to the inaccessibility of life. If we can just make the world a lot more accessible, person by person, we can change the world forever. The world should not be made for people with abilities because we all have them, all of us. I wanna end with this little quote that I said once, and I continue to use it. When you walk into a room, we will never cause discord. We will always cause an encore. When we walk around, we will no longer walk discouraged, but we will walk to encourage. And wherever we are, may we let people know that we are not disabled, but that we are enabled because we can do all things. There is nothing impossible, and therefore I share I walk by faith and not by sight. And I have my social media. If you guys want to follow me, if you see my username here on Zoom, if you go to YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, look up Danny Acosta Official, you can find me. And if you want to go to my website where I have all my social media as well, it's dannyacosta.com. One N D A N Y Acosta.com. Thank you so much for the privilege and the honor of allowing me to speak to all of you. And thank you so much also to our ASL interpreters who are amazing, beautiful, and so unique to be able to transmit, transcend the power that we have 
all together, when we work, we are united. And when we are united, we are one. And together, we will get to our purpose. Thank you, guys. God bless you all. This is Maya speaking. Uh, Danny, you definitely made me smile today. And thank you so much for bringing your energy, positivity, teaching us about inaccessibility, perseverance, and a sharing about your experience as a blind person with kidney failure in school, your career, and general life. Thank this you. is May speaking. Now we'd like to open the webinar up to a Q&A. You can use the raise hand function on Zoom to verbally ask your questions or privately message your questions to myself, Maya, or Olivia for us to read out loud. To our panelists, feel free to keep your video on from now on so we can easily pin you if you have to answer a question. All right, um, this is Maya speaking. Uh, it doesn't seem like our chat has any questions. So I think we'll wrap up now. Thank you so much to all our, oh, I see. Uh, Bernadette, do you wanna read that out loud? Sure, can you guys hear me? Yeah. So my question, I work in a public school system as a PT and I have um, emotional support from administration to look at making the playground uh, accessible. And I guess I'm wondering um, in terms of you know, the asphalt and the things that the other speakers spoke about, like where would one begin in terms of getting an assessment to see what kinds of um, remedies are needed at a public school if anyone has any input. Um, this is Penny. I would, uh, if someone could contact me, I would refer to my colleague at Crystal Evans. I was also a member of the board of the DPC, like myself. She lives in Braintree. She's what took the initiative, the lead on um, our um, lawsuit. She was the chief, the, number, the first plaintiff. Um, her daughter, she's disabled and uh, she, she's one that uses the parks a lot in Braintree and she would know where to direct us. I would be happy to, uh, we could follow up with her and find some way to get back to people on that. But, um, and this is Mary Kalbach. I would also recommend reaching out to the Beverly School for the Deaf. They have recently installed a playground as such as has Spalding. And so the recreation department at Spalding might be able to direct you there as well. And I also believe the Pete Freights Foundation just installed a playground as well. So yeah. one of those three resources may be able to guide you in your process. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question, Darcy Dale uh, asks, in chat, she says, I'm wondering what we can do here in Hamilton to expedite the accessibility of our town hall. Uh, and in second comment, she says, I can't remember where I heard this, but it, it has been said that nobody is disabled because it is a social contract, which can be deconstructed by universal access. Well, is that my question as well being town hall? It's Penny. Um, one would have to be specific, like what the barriers are there, whether it's a threshold to get in or as in Brain Street, we have an auditorium with, that didn't have access to the stage. Um, you would need someone um, to assess what the actual barriers are, see which ones could be, um, what kind of adaptations would be made to give access, whether a ramp, they would remove the, let's say the threshold in front of town halls so in Brain Street, you know, have more of a ramp going in or, um, it would sort of depend on what the architectural access, architectural barriers were, which ones could be remedied in particular ways. Uh, again, um, 
these are questions that would be, I, we'd be able to give better advice offline a little bit if we had some way to be able to communicate with us. We could, you know, give you places that people that could do that kind of architectural, you know, access assessment. This is my speaking again, and Darcy comments that we have no ADA access at all, except a pothole filled ramp that is a second class access. I mean, to the town hall in Newtown? I believe so. Well, then, I mean, it depends. I mean, do you have a building inspector? I mean, do you have a, co a commission on disability to go to to complain? If not, then you'd have to go to the state level and can go to the mass office on disability um, and file a complaint. Um, you get some maybe out from MOD. Again, I don't know if MOD does direct inspections. I mean, do you have a building inspector in town? Do you have someone who handles the ADA accommodations in town? Uh, start there. I mean, um, but, you know, I mean, you have to you have to put some fire, you know, under under the the town leaders to make it accessible. Um, yeah, on the topic of this, I think that recently. Um, oh, sorry, this is Olivia. Um, Recently, there was something as part of the town budget um, where like many people had wanted to make uh, the Hamilton Town Hall finally ADA accessible, um, but it didn't pass. So just as some background information for people who aren't as involved with those town politics. So now it's well, kind of like we're kind of I think a lot of people are trying to figure out what do we do after that? Well, then you, you have to go above the town. Obviously, if the, if the town is not compliant with ADA, then you have to file a complaint at a higher level. Now, in our case, of course, we got lawyers that were willing to do a pro bono because they got $300,000 for the legal work. I mean, that's a lot of money in the settlement, um, but it was a two-year process. They put a lot, and we had uh, we had an expert witness um, who went out, who was an our expert who, who identified all the problems for us. Uh, he does live in Florida, but he did fly up for us. Um, so the thing is, I would go directly, if, if, if you've got a town that's non-compliant and voted against making accommodations, making the town hall compliant, I would go directly to the Mass Office and Disability with a complaint. Or the Disability Law Center. I mean, I'm not sure if one of those two places at the state level would file a complaint against your town. Ask them for advice where to how to proceed. Darcy, this is Maya speaking again. Darcy says, we are the only town in this congressional district that is in this position. Thank you, Penny. To any well, participants? Oh, sorry, Penny, go I, ahead. I mean, you know, like in Branch, you, depending on what it is, I mean, you could, re, you could make a request that they move all essential services to a different building, town services. that would normally be in town hall to an accessible building. I mean, you don't have to require them to build a whole new building. You, you know, you could, uh, Take a look at and see what what services are there, and you know, like like if you're talking about auditorium and stages for certain events, maybe that could be done at one of the schools. Like maybe your high school is more accessible. You could you could do it piece by piece. I would assume on a temporary basis. I don't think you can force a town to come up with the. Uh, you, have to, you only have to have the services accessible. I don't believe you can force a town to somehow tax the local uh, citizens enough to build a whole new town hall. I think you would have to take a look at what's going on at town hall and where you could distribute those services. Other places in town that would be accessible. They're gonna to have to be accessible to services, but not necessarily in that building, I would, I would assume. All right, if any other participants have any comments or questions that they'd like to share, uh, again, please privately message myself, Olivia or Maeve. Um, this is the time to do that, or if you would like to unmute and share vocally. Um, this is Colin. I can respond quickly to uh, Darcy's second question about, um, you know, universal access and, and disability. I, I think to an extent that that's true, right? I mean, I it's. You know, we, we believe generally as a movement that disability is a social construct, right? That, um, you know, society, when it creates its institutions, determines which bodies the minds will have access and which will not. And therefore, by changing those institutions, you can remove uh, those barriers. You, can, you know, the disability arises as a thing from impairment. Disability arises when you can't access something. Um, I will say that, you know, we obviously have a long way to go. To strive towards a society of universal access, right? Universal design. 
Um, I also do think as a movement, like we need to sometimes do a better job of making space for people whose uh, whose conditions are, you know, inherently unpleasant, right? You know, I, I think, you know, people with chronic pain, people with, you know, cystic fibrosis, et cetera, like those are conditions which people encounter all kinds of barriers in society because of ableism, which need to be removed. They are, do also experience some inherent unpleasantness because of the medical side of that. And I think we as a movement can be big enough to embrace both of those truths simultaneously. We need to construct a society that is um, fully accessible, that removes those barriers, but also that, you know, we can have disability pride, we can believe in, you know, in, you know, the fullness of human diversity and still not make people feel like they have to be perfectly happy with their bodies and their day-to-day -day experiences in order to be part of part of this movement, part of this identity, if that makes sense. And Darcy says, this is Maya again. Yes, you are right. Thank you, Colin. We are a very wealthy town that can afford to give all our citizens access, all people. And to panelists, Bernadette says, this forum has been very helpful, especially participants sharing their lived experience. Thank you so much. If there are any more questions or comments from panelists uh, that you, you guys would like to share, uh, feel free to. Danny, uh, you're muted still. Uh, Danny, if you're still there, we can't hear you yet. All right, it looks like we're having some tech issues. Um, hopefully, Danny will come back. Uh, and I, uh, but for now, I'm just going to conclude. Thank you all for attending this webinar and thanks again for amazing panelists and interpreters. This webinar is part of a summer series and our next webinar will be about mental health care access. Uh, you can find out more information on that and our other programs by following us on social media at HW Human Rights and checking out our website, hwhumanrights.org. Uh, thanks again all for coming. I hope you all have a wonderful day. So long.